to you. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Vijay Kumar. He comes from a, uh, a university, a, uh, a center of learning in Chicago called the IIT. There's quite a lot of uh, people here in love with the IIT. There's actually people that have gone to IIT, like uh, Mr. Dejo, uh, Eduardo, and, um, and there's also Rishkin Pal, and there's other people here that are fans of IIT. IIT probably has 80%, 90% of people that go there are not designers. About 75% of people that go there are not designers, so maybe Lars could have easily ended up there coming from a business background. And Professor Vijay Kumar, what he did is he uh, systematized a lot of learning through a lot of years of practice and experience, and uh, both um, as a professional but also as an academic, as a teacher, as a professor, uh, into um, ways of actually uh, developing products that matter. So, no further delay, Professor Vijay Kumar. Thank you. Um, uh, the uh, first slide might be coming up. Um, um, thank you for having me here. It's a wonderful time that I'm having uh, in this event and in Lisbon and Portugal for the first time. So I'm really enjoying uh, myself. Uh, wonderful presentations, right? Um, wonderful speakers. Um, learning hell of a lot, um, and um, uh, I'm uh, particularly excited because my star student Louis is here. Right? <laughs> you mentioned that I was here. That's why you're excited. So um, it's it's a great time. Um, let's see if we can fix that. I can use my dongle. I want to switch. this one it worked. <laughs> yes. yes, that's good. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, good technology. So, initially, I'm going to be a little personal, right? Um, I'm going to sort of share with you very quickly the journey that I took um, that took me over many years and the exciting journey that I had and, uh, and the kind of thing that I went through. Okay? So, you can, you can see I've, I've written my name right there. Um, I had to write my name. Uh, is there a... Is there an infrared here? No, no infrared. Okay. I had to I had to write my name right there because <laughs> that's how that's what I looked like in nineteen seventy-six. I had a full beard, right? <laughs> I was an undergraduate student doing product design in um, the only one design school in India, National Institute of Design. Uh, that is the only school that existed at that time. No one knew what design was at that time. But um, the interesting thing is on the right, what you see is uh, Charles Eames, right? Charles and Ray Eames in the morning, someone else uh, you know, sort of shared the powers of tent and the kind of thing that they, they were working on. Um, the story is that the uh, government of India wanted to start a design school, because there was no design school in India, and there was no competency in India to, to think about a design school. So they invited Charles and Ray Eames, husband and wife, 
to India and ask their advice, what kind of a design school we should start. And they traveled all around in India for about six months. And they observed and talked to a lot of people and they submitted their recommendations to the government of India. That's how the design school was started. And that was started in 1965, I think. But in 1976, they came back again to the school just to check on the school that they started, how is it working. So I had the opportunity to sort of uh, talk with him and work with him on a workshop and things like that. And that was the beginning point of uh, the inspiration that I got from people like him. Um, Charles and Ray Eames, if you know, he's not an individual, he's a phenomenon, right? He's an he's a, he's a environmental designer, architect, an interior designer, furniture designer, filmmaker, the powers to turn information visualizer, toy maker, or you know, packed into one wonderful brain, right? And how his mind worked uh, when I talked with him and had a conversation with him, it was fascinating. My mouth was kind of open when I was uh, sort of fascinated by how, how he connected dots and think about systems and big things, right? So that, that uh, sort of started a seed in me to know more about the process of design. What, what, what goes on in people's mind when they are creative, when they are connecting dots? So from that, from that time onwards, I somehow, fortunately or unfortunately, I got trapped in that topic of understanding the process of design. That's why the, method, the methods was my focus. Uh, 1986, I graduated from this uh, National Institute of Design and I was practiced a little bit in India, but I had a tough time because at that time I couldn't even explain what design is to company. They didn't, they didn't understand at all. But somehow I managed to convince certain companies and started practicing there. But 1983, 84 time, if you remember, some of you, some of you may not be even born at that time. But if you remember, you know, so the first Macintoshes came into the world. Mac came into the world. Desktop publishing became popular. Computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing. Computers came into our lives, designers' lives, and they could do wonderful things, and you could use computers in wonderful ways. Um, I read wonderful articles about that, but I could not get my hands on computers in that little corner that I was, uh, I was uh, living. Um, so I searched around the world, um, all around the world, where, where can I get that competency? Because I was always driven by the idea of being on the cutting edge of things. Um, and I came across this gentleman, Professor Charles Owen. He was leading the Institute of Design that I'm teaching today, from the IIT. He was leading the school and he was doing the most cutting edge work on computer supported, he called it structured planning technique. Computer supported techniques for dealing with complex systems. So he was really in future, he was working in future. So I read his articles, I contacted him. Uh, how did I contact him? through that machine, right? <laughs> you recognize that, some of you may not even recognize that, it is obsolete, it's a typewriter, right? I used to type, type letter, real chuck, so and so, mail it and wait for four months, uh, for four weeks before, um, you know, before I get a response. So look at the way we are today, right? The instant message across. Uh, but he was really uh, call, uh, sort of, uh, um, really taken apart. We had a good uh, rapport established. He said, why don't you come to our school, Chicago? I have, we, will, we will give you what you want. So that's how I ended up in Chicago uh, in 1987, I came here. Um, at that time, there was this gentleman, right? He was, all, he was a professor at Chicago. I don't know how many of you have heard Jay Doblin. Jay Doblin was another fantastic teacher um, and leader and pioneer in bringing design thinking into USA and all across the world. Um, so he was my teacher and I got it done from him about system thinking, right? Um, and Jay Doblin um, started a firm called Doblin, uh, initially it was called Doblin Group, 1990 he started um, that firm. Actually he died in 1989, but Jay Doblin's partner uh, continued that firm in 1990 onwards. So I met his partner and uh, I joined that company as a uh, design planner, um, 1990. If you, if you look at that time period, uh, nobody was talking about design in the term that in, in which we are talking about design. The words of ethnography and design did not exist at that time. Strategic design did not exist at that time. Innovation 
very limited uh, you know, sort of uh, ways in which you talked about that. So I had gone through the evolution of how design perception changed over time. And while I was working at Dublin, I had the opportunity to work with some of the biggest companies um, as, a, as a consultant. And that's when I got the opportunity to sort of uh, try out different techniques, user research techniques, observational analysis, and uh, data analysis techniques, and brainstorming techniques and that I could experiment with my clients. Those are, those are wonderful times that I could really develop some tools and you know, make it part of my client service. Um, nine, 2002, so sort of I, I uh, kept on consulting, but 2002, after 12 years of consulting, I decided I need to sort of rebalance my activities. Consulting is good. I learned a lot. You developed a lot of techniques and tested all of them. Now I want to rebalance my activities. I want to share my knowledge with more people. I want to teach. I really love you know, like teaching. So I joined the school as a full-time faculty, and that's what I'm enjoying now. Um, you know, my students are great. Look at look at Lewis, right? That is his way of thinking, right? The presentation that he had in the morning, fantastic. So my students are really great. I'm having a wonderful time um, looking at complex problems, and the students bring different kinds of perspective, just like what we are doing. And I'm fascinated by the presentation because each presentation brings in a really different point of view, and all particular is a, is a huge knowledge base that we can build on. So that, that's what I'm enjoying now, and that's what IT is, uh, is doing. And these are some of, the, some of the companies that I'm working with now, um, uh, helping them out in terms of design thinking and adopting some of these techniques. Um, and a common thread, you know, the, I've, I've talked about a few uh, personalities that affected me, and Darwin Group and Institute of Design affected me, a lot more. But the common thread between all of them is this idea of systems thinking. So that's what, that's what I'm going to focus on now, systems thinking, go, going beyond the product <laughs> to the system level. Right? That's what we are challenged with in these days. Right? Um, the simple definition of a system is a, is a uh, interconnected set of components, interconnected set, set of, there's a very you know, sort of core definition of a system. Um, and we are talking about product types, right? So um, the way I connect and the idea of productization of the system is systems are products linked in context, right? Even if you are talk talking about products or, a, or an app or a software product or a digital or a physical product, they are all part of a system. In the context is what makes that makes that work very well, uh, wonderfully. So. That's what we need to appreciate. Sometimes we have to switch our mind from a product to a system thinking. Right? That's what I'm going to focus on a little bit. But what are smart systems? We, you know, Louis in the morning talked a little bit about smart cities and things like that. Um, so what are smart systems? Right? That, that's where a lot of focus is uh, being given today. If you look at um, some of the biggest companies, the, most of the efforts are in in uh, creating smart systems, smart cities, smart objects, smart homes, smart car, you know, smart interfaces, and all kinds of things, right? So we as innovators need to pay a little bit of attention to that. What, what, what is the trend that are happening there? How can we contribute the idea of smartness, right? So this is a very really simple definition that I think, you know, my, my point of view is in order to make any system smart, you have to, you have to make those systems self-aware. Anything that is self-aware, that knows itself, it presents and what goes on around, that one step towards smartness. So when you are challenged with products or uh, you know, software designs, that's something that you may have to keep in mind. How can you make my product self-aware? Self-learning, right? It, it captures all the knowledge from around itself and learn from it and you can, you can respond to it, responsive learn from it and be, be able to respond to it and predictive, in a predictive way, respond not blindly, in a predictive way, oh, this might be a future situation, so I'm going to predict myself to behave in a certain way. So systems do that. Human beings do that very, very easily because we've got a nice brain, but things like this, if they have to do, we have to put in some smartness into it to be responsive, to be self-aware, to be learning and autonomous. Smart systems, the smartest, when they are autonomous, they have an independent existence. 
So something that we need to pay attention to. So I just uh, want to uh, take you through a few examples of uh, what, what we mean by smart systems. Smart products is the one instance of smart systems. Um, a good example, this is my own personal experience, a good example is that uh, you know, a physical device like a smartphone, we call it smartphone, right? Physical device overlaid with smart content, right? This is Google Map that I depend on a lot on a daily basis. I'm dependent on Google Map because it's smart. They, they help me on information that I myself cannot, um, you know, cannot um, cannot achieve on my own. Um, do you guys use uh, Google Map or is there a local version or Google Map? Is, yeah, Google Map is a standard thing. Um, look at the way in which it, it is self-aware, right? Self-aware means it knows where you are. It is self-learning. It looks at all the traffic density patterns and gives you red areas and yellow areas and gives you suggestions, predictive suggestions. If you lose your way, it tells you, tells you alternate roads. So, that's a classic example of a very simple thing that is smart, that helps me. Um, it's, 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 it's a system that helps me because I cannot do it myself. Right? That's the value of, uh, of smart, smart products. Um, there are other classic examples. A lot of, a lot of us and our speakers have talked about Apple. I'm also going to talk about Apple, even though I'm not a salesperson for Apple. <laughs> but I will... Uh, I will use this Apple example of um, the iPod. Previously, someone talked about the, the evolution of iPod, right? Classic example of Apple getting into um, into making their innovation smarter and smarter over time, right? Uh, the journey that they had gone through, um, 2000, around 2001, 2002 time, they were MP3 players. Right, remember that, that that device, MP3 player that you can hang around your neck and it can store about 10, 10 songs. So Apple took the stance of let's make a make a device that's not just a better MP3 player. Let's make a device that really supports the music listening experience of people. Right, that's a smart action that Apple has taken, taking a product from just a not just a better product really a smart product that really supports experience of people. That's the mission, actually, mission and mission statement that Steve Jobs took. Then, is, let's not design a better MP3 player. Let's create a system that really supports the experience of music listening. And that was the iPod was the result of that. Right? Um, they put in a lot of effort, you know, designing the iPod. Of course, it had got a, 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 a nice feature, nice aesthetics and uh, circular motion interface which is pretty nice at that time. But those are not only the reason why it was yes. They went beyond that. iTunes. They brought in iTunes. The product became a content-enabled product. It became way smarter than just a product, right? Content, you could uh, assemble your all your music and have a collection and you can play it any, any time. And then it, you know, it also had several skins that you can put on, different colors, pink and green, and skin that you can put on because Teenagers love that. They, they love to make that iPod personalizable, right? And then they, um, they even had business model innovations overlaid on that, on top of that, uh, which is downloading one song for 99 cents. At that time, if you had to buy, buy music, you had to buy a CD. Like CD at that time uh, had about 14, 15 songs in it. To me, it was a counterintuitive, user-unfriendly um, design because many a time most of us don't don't uh, don't want to buy all the 14, 15 songs. We like two or three songs in that in that album, right? We want to listen two or three. We are buying 14, 15. That's why it's a counterintuitive. It's not user user friendly. So that's why I after kind of reframed that that idea and said, why can't we provide um, single songs for you know, for 99 cents and let people decide what they want to buy, right? So that was a uh, that, those are the reasons why Apple iPod became successful. Of course, they went, I mean, uh, this was taken from their own website, but what I really liked about this um, are those two words, engineered and funness. Engineered for maximum funness. There is something deep, um, you know, there's something deep, deeply valuable in those two words. 
you know, can you can you figure that out? It is it's about the merger or the convergence between technology and people's needs, people's needs for fun. So technology and people's needs are merging together. So it's very, very reflected in the tagline that they have. Something that Apple did very well. And as designers, we are talking about that today. Even today, we talked talk to a lot of, lot of um, you know, um, frameworks that brings technology and people together. Um, they went on to um, uh, dealing with phones, right? 2007, as someone mentioned, that was a drastic, drastic um, uh, milestone in Apple's, Apple's evolution. It became more, phones became marvelous. The phone was not just for making calls. It was a companion for information, right? So that's how it became modern, and they went on to tablets, and then uh, more recently, they are going into wearables, right? A few months ago, probably less than a year ago, they went to wearables, Apple Watches. Um, we are watching it very carefully, how that will play out, how it will have a broader impact on other devices. Uh, it will take some more time before we realize that. And of course, as you know, you, you might be knowing this, that they are, Apple is a kind of a secretive company. They, they develop innovations in a very sequestered team working in a corner of the room. They, they don't talk about what they do. So um, they are in the process of designing an ap Apple car. I don't know what they do. They call it Apple car or iCar or whatever it is. They are planning to make the car available in a couple of years' time. A uh, lot of effort that's going on. Uh, going on. I, I, I believe uh, what they have what they have mentioned, there will be a driverless car. Driverless car, which is fully user-centered. user, user -centered. Um, I'm dying to see what, what it will be. It will be really fascinating to see what, uh, what that, uh, how that happened. And then they are even getting into uh, smart, smart IoT devices. Right? I, earlier we mentioned about IoT, Internet of Things, which, which is about connecting devices to the Internet so that they can communicate to each other. And we can control um, things at home much much better than what we do today. So Apple, I don't know any of any of you using HomeKit, Apple's HomeKit, not a It's pretty new uh, system they are bringing out. A HomeKit is a device or a system that connects many devices at home. Your, uh, your refrigerator, oven, and clock, and computers, everything can be connected through what is called a HomeKit. So they're, they're trying to make the home products smarter by having that home kit, home, home kit idea. Uh, so so that, give, that takes us to the idea of smart homes. A um, <clears throat> lot of other products, other companies are focused on making home smarter, not just the product, home smarter, just like, just like the Apple home kit. Um, you may have come across, is, is this product available here, Nest? Not yet, okay. Uh, very interesting innovation. It's a, it's a simple thermostat. Right? We have thermostats that control the temperature in, at home, right? You can adjust it. Very user-friendly thermostat which is connected to the internet so that you can control the room temperature through your, uh, through your iPhone and all kinds of things. It becomes a really smart um, HVAC system in your home, right? And they also have uh, the, the product next to that. Um, what you see, the white one, is a smoke, smoke detector and carbon monoxide detector. And that, those also become smart, right? If the battery dies down in those devices, it'll give you a beep and then it, it gives you signals to, 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 to take care of that. And it, can't, it can be controlled through Apple, Apple iPhone or smart uh, phones. So they're tending towards, homes are tending toward that kind of smartness. But of course, we have to be careful, as Louis mentioned in the morning, we have to be careful in not getting trapped in the technology aspect of connecting, right? What do, do people really want that connectivity or not? So we, as a designer, we have to ask the question, IoT is good, connectivity is good, smart homes are good. But do you, what, what, what about the connectivity at home do we really care as human beings? That's the question that we as designers should start with, right? Other companies are following suit uh, for the same kind of system, like Nest and HVAC system. Um, I'm not sure whether you have come across Amazon Eco, 
that's again another new system that Amazon is creating, which is equivalent to connecting products and devices at home, and uh, staples, and a whole lot of companies are coming out with There's a huge emphasis on systems like that. But the emphasis is all on technology, right? How to develop technology. We have to go beyond that. That's why we have to, as a designer, we have to interject. We have to interject that process and say, don't just think about technology of connecting those devices. First ask, you ask the question of connecting those devices is helpful for us in our daily life or not. Start with that question of, uh, that's something that we put a lot of emphasis on at IIT, the science core. Um, we deliberately take away from the technology-based innovations to human-centered technology-based innovations, right? Something that we have to pay attention to. Smart cities, as you know, Tremendous amount of attention being given to the idea of smart cities. If you look at the, some of the, the, the news items, every, every big company, every city is focused on how to make the city smart, right? Because we have, we have developments going on telecommunications and internet technology and sensor technology and things like that, all that allows us to make our city smarter. Right? Um, <clears throat> why, did, why is that in, in, in focus? A cross there, so I, I don't know what it means, right? <laughs> it is a graph. Um, population, right? That's the trend that is happening in population. Can you can you kind of figure it out? Rural population. In 1950, <coughs> most of the people on earth are in rural areas. And cities are only really about 15, 20 percent of population. <coughs> and the world are uh, are in the city. In 2011, I suppose, 2011, the population became 50-50. 50% of the population in rural areas, 50% of the population is in urban areas. In 2050, predicted that it will cross over. People living in cities will be about 70% 70, 70 of all the people on earth. Only 30% will be outside the city. <coughs> so, so that itself is a great indication that we have to, we have to keep thinking about smart cities. Okay? Six plus billion people will be living in cities by 2050. Right? Almost, almost double, more than double the number of what we have. So imagine the streets in Lisbon, right? Imagine the population double, right? Uh, the rush hour traffic will be double, right? So imagine that condition, so we have to be prepared to make our city smarter in, in those conditions. That's where a lot of cities have taken, taken some early steps. I'm really fascinated by work. some of the cities that are on the cutting edge of addressing this smartness, like Barcelona, for example. There's lots of interesting things going on at a government level, at the private sector level, to make Barcelona city smarter, right? And, Free internet is uh, almost a reality there. They put uh, you know, the stations all over the place, so close to each other, that anywhere in the city you have free internet access, so that IoT can work seamlessly. There's no disconnection anytime. And then and, and, yeah, they've divided, uh, they've designed uh, devices for old people when they're in the city. They, have, they can wear devices, there's an emergency device, they can call for help, healthcare systems and kits and knowing about the city, a whole lot of activities that are very dynamic at a city level, making our life really interesting. Uh, not only Barcelona is just one example. I've, I've been working with um, Dubai. Uh, have you gone to Dubai? Dubai is pretty, pretty much on the cutting edge of a smart city. A lot of, um, I came to know when I was there about a uh, few months ago, I came to know that the government has created systems within Dubai in which 60,000 buildings, 60,000 buildings are connected through the cloud and they are all manipulated. They, they, they can control the HVAC, HVAC, energy consumption, and things like that um, as a whole at the city level, not building level. 60,000 buildings are connected. They have been able to reduce the energy consumption of the whole city by 30% by saving energy on electricity, lamps, and HVAC, and things like that, sensors, sensing people's presence in buildings, they, their empty spaces, the HVAC goes down, lighting goes down, they have saved 30%. That's, uh, 
that's pretty smart. Uh, so lots of cities, even places like India, um, you know, emerging economy, right? So the cities um, have a lot of problems, like Bombay, the population is about 20 million, right? So you can imagine the amount of challenges that they have. But recently, India got a Prime Minister, uh, Modi, his name is, is uh, pretty advanced. He's a, he's a Twitter freak, right? He communicates with people through tweets and things like that. Highly on the cutting edge of technology and communication. And uh, he unveils a plan. He, like mission statement earlier, you, know, you mentioned about JFK, stating that we'll put a man on the moon and bring, bring that man safe back home. That is a mission statement that John F. Kennedy made, and everyone sort of rallied around that. So similarly, Modi is putting that mission statement, we are going to build 100 smart cities in the next four or five years' time. Um, so they, they are very much um, active on that, those kinds of missions these days. So um, the idea is that every city is um, putting a lot of emphasis on that. So as innovators, we have to pay attention to that. Even if we are you know, designing a product or a bicycle or some product that, that is in the city, can you go beyond the product and think of it as part of a complex system which the city is and think about interconnections, right? Um, so the question is, what can we do as innovators, as designers in that context? Um, the challenge of making everything smart, right? So that's where the rest of my presentation, I'm 16 minutes, I have to rush through. Um, the rest of my presentation, I'm going to talk about six fundamental mindsets or principles that I think will be helpful for anyone to be effective and successful in building smart systems. So let me go through one by one. Integrate stakeholder perspectives. Integration, this is about integration, convergence happening. Um, driver, it, it, any innovation has fundamentally four drivers in our models. One driver is about technology. You know, I, I got this technology, how to create an innovation based on that. Another driver is about organizations like companies like Google and Microsoft has their own you know, agenda for creating innovation. So organizations drive, whether it is a for-profit or a non-profit organization, drives innovations. The fourth one is experience. Is that something that we drive as designers, user-centered designers drive, or user experience designers drive uh, innovation based on what is good for people and their experiences. And there is a fourth driver which is about social innovative initiatives which is about sustainability and greenness and uh, how to make our society sustainable and how to, make, how to com build uh, sustainable communities, how to reduce violence. In Chicago, we are doing very interesting projects on reducing shooting in some of the bad neighborhoods, the risky neighborhoods. Designers play a big role there in, in creating sustainable communities where violence is minimal. So in, all, in that context, as a designer, as an innovator, uh, whether you are doing a startup company or whether you are working for a corporation or a consulting, something that you have to keep in mind, how do I integrate all these four drivers? You might put emphasis on one side, but you cannot forget the other side. Right? You might put emphasis on experience-based design, but you cannot forget technology and business uh, modeling and sustainability issues, something that we have to keep in mind. Something that we do, um, a lot of techniques you can adopt to make that happen, um, happen, ha happen in a practical way. Something that we do on a, on a daily or weekly basis is what I call inspired collaboration. Any problem that we have, any project that we are working on, we bring in all the stakeholders once in a while, including the customer, the, the investor, the financial analyst, the, you know, the social scientist and psychologist, and things like that. We discussion on that topic, right? So different perspectives can make that integration happen. So this is something that we practice on a day-to-day -day basis. None of our projects are individual projects. They're all team projects, which are about inspired, creating inspired collaboration sessions. Um, there is also this new technique called open innovation. Some of you may have, uh, we've addressed that a little bit. It's about innovation becoming open-ended that anyone can contribute. <laughs> our role as designers might go, go down a little bit. We don't have to innovate on our own in the future. If that, I think we are going in that direction. We might, be, um, uh, we might change our roles as better facilitators rather than innovators. Um, we can facilitate ideas that come from anywhere in the world and then create innovation based on that. Open innovation like New York City has a website where you can 
put your own idea to make the city better and then the city collects all those ideas and they, they take action on that. Private companies like Procter & Gamble, Procter & Gamble if you come across, they have created a system what they call, um, uh, what, is the, what is the term for that, connected, connect, yeah, yeah. So that that in the, that the system, anyone from anywhere in the world can put an idea for Procter and Gamble, and if that idea is uh, developed into a product, you get some royalty and some incentive you get. So that's the open innovation situation that we have to pay attention to as designers. Uh, second, reframe, reframe mental models of systems that we use. This is a very crucial um, crucial mindset or a principle. Anything that we take on as a challenge, as a design pro design project or a startup idea, can you change the current mental model, challenging assumptions? That's what we mean by reframe. Uh, for example, you know, lots of effort that are being taken by companies, is, uh, including delivery systems. Right? Um, this is something that Amazon, as you know, is considering the drone delivery. Right? They are completely reframing the idea of delivery system. Uh, it seems that I, I live in a condo in Chicago on the fourth floor and I've got a balcony. It seems that in about a couple of years' time, I'll get my packages on my balcony, right? A drone will come, fly down, and drop the box on my balcony. That, that's becoming real, right? So a lot of challenges, of course, of legal challenges and things like that are there, but that, that is already there. So that's something that we have to pay attention to. And even this, we are familiar with that, right? Driverless cars. Google has already developed, um, you know, viable driverless cars, and cities are preparing themselves for driverless cars. Um, I, I heard that Dubai city again last a few months ago. I was there. They um, in 2020 they think the entire Dubai will be full of driverless cars. So they're preparing themselves for the city. 2020 is not very far away, right? Five years down the line. They think that the old city will be full of driverless cars. If you drive a car, you'll be a hard person out, right, in that in that city. So, something that we have to pay attention to. I don't know how it'll, uh, how will happen with the three-wheeler, two 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 two, two vehicles, right? <laughs> um, and that happens in uh, Lisbon. But uh, create the delightful experiences for people. That's something I think all of us all of us know, and I don't have to speak too much about that. Human centeredness. But one thing I will say, if she is your customer, sure. if she is your, you're designing an innovation for her, you have to really know her. What's going on in her mind? What are her needs? What are her motivations? What are her desires? How can I put a smile on her face? How can I make her delightful? Um, whatever I produce as a product, can it be thought of as a gift that I'm giving her? Gift giving, right? Gift giving is about empathy. And when you give a gift to somebody, you are thinking about what that somebody will like. It's not about my liking, right? So anything that you produce, can you think of it as a gift that you are giving to the consumer or the end user? That's a very good mindset to have. Um, of course, Apple, you know, Apple has practiced that pretty, pretty well. Um, of course, uh, this is a funny example. Um, the, there was a dentist. In a spectrum. Then this is the last place that anyone or one of us will want to go, right? Not a pleasant experience, right? Especially with children dentists, right? Children, the children get really scared about this. the last place they want to go, right? So this dentist said that, that, oh, let's, let's delight the children. Let's design masks, masks that sort of, uh, you know, will be funny for children. But the effect was opposite, right? <laughs> Pretty scary masks, right? <laughs> Uh, children stop going there. You know, the dentist had to close shop, right? So <laughs> the idea is the light for experience-based innovations are great, but you have to be thoughtful behind it, right? Um, so yeah, I already mentioned that. Can you think of that? Think of innovation as a gift to uh, to your consumers. Ensure sustainable environments and society. So. Uh, Related to smart cities, you know, we, we, we talk about sustainability these days, right? We have to protect the environment, grow the society. Two aspects of sustainability. Lots of experiments happening happening in the world beyond greenness and environmental waste reduction and things like that. Things like that, experiments like this. A city is called SITE, Center for Innovation, Testing and Evaluation, um, which, is, which is being built in New Mexico, a desert area. They are, they're going to build it. They just started this project a few months ago. 
they create an organization, they build a city, is a prototype city, not an actual city, it's a prototype city where things about sustainability can be experimented, tested. They, they'll put driverless cars on that city and test out whether the sensors are working or not. They will put uh, HVAC systems and sensors and all kinds of things. It's a prototype city, right? It may be a ghost city, but it can add a lot of value in terms of learning, learning new systems. So um, even private enterprises like Google are taking on that responsibility. They're going away from their digital, uh, the, the, they're creating new initiatives to get on the street and talk to people and create systems on the street makes people's life on the streets better. So lots of initiatives happening here. And this is a place the next to my school, the next building, it's called 1871. It is, it's uh, come from um, 1871, Chicago had a great fire, like Lisbon had a tsunami and a fire, right? 1871, Chicago, the old city, almost the old city was burned down. They had to reconstruct. So 1871, they borrowed that um, name from that uh, incident and it is an incubator um, facilitation system. It's a building where you, can, where you can come in, anyone, any entrepreneur can come in, we'll get full support, right? Tech support and, and you know, getting, uh, getting money and all kinds of banking support, all kinds of support so that individual entrepreneurs can be successful. That's a very good sustainable model for growing your society and businesses, right? So I'm really fascinated by effects, uh, 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 initiatives like that. And the fifth one is about facilitate, facilitating an open platform for sharing. Right? Um, smart systems would have, would have to be thought of as platforms. Just like what in the common platforms that we understand, Google and Facebook, they're all platforms. They give you the infrastructure, we're all building, building on top of that infrastructure. And that's how the system becomes modern. Um, can we create, as innovators, can we create platform? Go beyond a product. Think of that. Can we create a platform in which other people can build systems there? So um, I'm, I was fascinated again by Dubai government because um, I'm advising United Arab Emirates as one of the innovators, uh, uh, eight member international team, advising the government about new innovations. I'm part of that team, advising them. So uh, last time when I went there, this was the, this is the, Really fascinating things happening then, even at the government level. Right? Government is creating a platform in Dubai where entrepreneurs and businesses can pr pretty easily build businesses around there. Um, and finally, the last section, I have only five minutes left, last, sec last section I want to focus on my primary interest. Uh, I've ri written a book on this particular principle, use a discipline process for design. Um, that the book is called 101 Design Methods. So I'll quickly go through a very generic process that I think is pretty useful for everyone. Um, if you look at the map with two axes, real and abstract, understand me, right? That's the two by two map there. There are seven modes in which all of us um, ought to be there. There's a, there's a mode in which we call sense intent. The first mode um, in which uh, we have to determine our mission or our vision, what our intent is. What is going on in the world? What are the new trends that are happening? What are the dynamics going on in the world? Are there opportunities in that direction that I can create some innovations? Those are early questions that you ask. What do I innovate? Where the world is going and what are the opportunities? Um, very much, very, very similar to that uh, surfer on a beach. He goes, stands there with a surfboard for many minutes, surveying the sea. He stands there for about 20 minutes, right? looking at the waters, and oh, the waves are good there. If I go there, I can have a lot of fun. Um, is a storm brewing? Are there sharks in the water? Right? All kinds of questions. He's assessing it, assessing the dynamics, and then decides to jump into the water. So even before jumping into your project, you have to spend enough time. What am I doing? Decide, right? So that's a, that's a mode. And once you have a good understanding of the mode, you have to understand reality. So there are two things that are happening. One is understanding the context, right? Uh, that is obvious. You, know, you have to understand all the parts and pieces of the context, whatever your topic is. And understanding people, obviously we put a lot of emphasis on that. What is going on in her mind? How can I buy empathy towards her? And once you have a good understanding, you can start moving from real to abstract on the vertical scale. That's where you, you be in abstract mode of 
what is all this information that a collector from research need? Understanding the context and the people, what does it mean? Where are the patterns? Where are the hot spots? Where are the opportunities? We call it framing insight. We have developed a lot of tools to create patterns out of random data. So that will be a good start for me to move, move from left to right. That's when you create stuff, right? Understanding and making stuff. Exploration of ideas, I think we are familiar to all of us. We do brainstorming sessions a whole lot of times, right? Explore a whole lot of ideas. And uh, of course, uh, you are familiar with this. This is a movie shot, right? Are you familiar with this, right? Minority Report, right? Several years ago, 14 years ago, when Steven Spielberg made that movie, um, he created a design team, design team, design team, right? We're working on. We asked them, 15 years or 20 years down the line, what are the possible in innovations? Can you can you create a set of ideas? that we can put it inside the inside the movie. So I've, I've given some examples there, just to relate the phase and self-driving cars, they're all shown in the movie. Designed by a design team, ethnographers going and doing research and then creating ideas, right? If you look at um, the movie, movie and all the innovations that are shown in the movie, 85% of the innovations shown in the movie have become real. 85% of those ideas, so the, the, that's a great, um, great testament, testament to the designers being really predicted in, in terms of their ideas. Um, uh, ideas exploration alone is not enough, you have to package them, framing solution, package them in a nice way that can be implemented. And ultimately, uh, it should be like a gift that you can give it to the uh, customer. And finally, you have to make them real, right? Make them real means um, you have to take action on your ideas. Your ideas are abstract, that's where your prototype get made, or that's where strategies are planned. I particularly want to emphasize on this. Um, uh, companies are putting a lot, a lot of emphasis on really interesting socially driven strategies, like Tom shoes. Is it prevalent here, Tom shoes? If you buy a pair of Tom shoes, another pair is given to us in, to to their family or a kid in South America or South Africa. Right? You're you're doing good when you're buying. So that is it. Uh, that's a business um, driven strategy, they're not running at, at a loss. So things like that and then this whole process, even though I, I, I told you the process in a linear way, it's kind of non-linear, right? The squiggly line thing, right? And then it is iterative, but for convenience sake, we can take them as a linear seven-step model. We can organize mindsets, each, each one of those modes we have to have a mindset and we can organize our metrics that we use. There are 101 of them which, are, which I have covered in the book. They're all very useful, but I'm really glad that the book is being widely used across the world. It has been translated into Chinese, Japanese, Korean, all kinds of languages. It's a testament that people are using it very effectively. Um, so I will, I will leave it there. Um, so please, please pay attention to those six principles and go deeper in practicing them in your own projects. Thank you very much.